All right. Um, uh, as I said in my introductory re remarks, uh, Gail truly is uh, New York City's open data fairy godmother. Uh, I, it's an honor to have her up on stage with her uh, um, staff member, Will Colgrove, who is also a compatriot in the New York City Civic Innovation Fellows program, which we'll be presenting after lunch in the antechamber. Uh, and now I'm gonna hand this off to Lauren Renee, who is the designer, creator of all graphics uh, for the NYC School of Data. She and I stayed up till one o'clock in the morning making sure that you had these really cool flyers um, and the signs throughout the space. Um, so when you, uh, yes, give her a round of applause. She's also a dedicated co-organizer at Beta NYC, and so it's an honor to have the three of my friends up here on stage and turn it over to them. Uh, just as a reminder for those of you who are in the antechamber or throughout Civic Hall, um, we're gonna do a class photo. We did one a few years ago, so uh, if you can hear my voice and you're not in the main stage area, please come into the main stage area by the end of this presentation, so that way you can be included in our uh, 2016 School of Data class photo. And now I present Lauren Renee. Hi everyone. It is. I hope that everyone is having a great time today. I know that I am. Um, we truly have a unique group of people here um, from varying skill sets. And I do think it's always great to come together and kind of touch base on sort of some of the basics of how we got here to begin with. So I'm so happy to welcome Gail Brewer and Will Cosgrove, her senior technology advisor. And today we're just gonna have a conversation, kind of just getting back to the basics and sort of understanding the role of the borough president's office and sort of the journey that got us to the open data law. And then at the end, we're gonna celebrate the fourth birthday by taking a class picture. Um, really excited about that. So let's get underway. So, hi Gail. Hi Will. Well, I'm so I'm very honored. excited to be here. Uh, me too, I'm terribly excited. <laughs> um, so let's just start, and I don't think a lot of us know the answer to this very basic question. What is the role of the Manhattan Borough President? Well, it's a good question, because most people don't know, and obviously for those of you in New York City or out, there are five boroughs, and there are five borough presidents, and we have a lot of fun together. We goof, we text, we laugh, we have lunch. Right now, it's the Brooklyn Borough President's turn for lunch. So if you run into Eric Adams, tell him, where's lunch? <laughs> but the issue is we are the uh, presidents of the borough to advise the mayor on borough issues. And it would seem strange because you have so much authority in the mayor's office. But the fact of the matter is, whether you're in Queens or Manhattan or anywhere else, there are particulars to that borough. We do four things in the most basic sense. Number one, we have a big role in land use. The mayor has suggested some changes in zoning, and so we've been working on the community boards on that. But every time there's a change in zoning, the borough president, along with the council and the city planning, has a role, and there's a big data tech involvement we can talk later. Number two, in Manhattan and elsewhere, we appoint 1,000 people to different boards. Some of you here are on community boards and you know about the 59 community boards, 12 in Manhattan. But we have a solid waste advisory board. We have a youth board. We have a senior board. We have all the cultural institutions in Manhattan have members of our staff or somebody we appoint. We appoint to the um, hospital board for the public hospitals. We appoint to the, to the school board and the citywide school board. And the list goes on. So the whole issue of how do you train them we're here with Deputy Borough President uh, Alden Bonilla, and he has set up a training, Robert's Rules of Order, data, land use, budgeting. 83 people in August showed up for bylaws training because it's not there. So we're doing an extra effort on the training of those whom we appoint. And then we allocate funding. You know that we allocate to schools. We'll talk more about that later and to parks and anything that is capital eligible and a tiny bit of expense money. And then finally, I read the charter. We can introduce legislation with a council member. Most recently, the one that I'm most proud of um, we have introduced 50 or 60 bills, seven or eight have passed. 
One of them is the Fair Chance Act. As of October 27, 2015, if you have committed a crime in the city of New York, you no longer have to check off that box that says, as you apply for a job, that you have a record. Because in the past, that went in one pile, and those who didn't have a record went in another pile. No more, no more. And it means that you have a second chance. You can be asked when you are offered the job, you can be asked by the employer, do you have a record, and, the lot, and there's more uh, that goes on after that. But it doesn't give you an initial no, which was the past. So those are the main roles that the uh, borough president plays in the greatest sense of the word. We get together with the council members and the, ca and the community boards once a month to talk about borough issues. Um, those are some of the overviews. And what is your vision for the role in your term? Well, you know, the, the vision is you want your borough um, to have a, a, a quality of life for the residents that has something that is excellent. And that includes trying to make the neighborhoods um, safer, healthier. It includes making the schools as good as possible. It includes trying to figure out how the environmental role will play uh, out for your borough. I know that in September, every single school is supposed to be recycling. We tried it on the west side of Manhattan and we were successful with organics. And then when it went citywide in the past, it was a disaster because what was put into the organics was often contaminated because it wasn't done by type A moms like the people in this room or type A dads. It was done by folks who didn't have an investment. Um, so we work on the environment. We work obviously on trying to figure out how we can have a better quality of life. The number one issue is the uh, affordable housing. And that's around the city, but in Manhattan it's particularly challenging. We want we want to make sure that we have a zoning code that is responsible to some of the uh, landmark issues and height issues, and we want to be able to breathe, uh, given the fact that the real estate is so expensive and so um, challenging. And I think we also want to have public schools that have hydroponics and have, uh, we want community gardens, we want green, um, we want a transportation system that works. When we redid East Midtown, which is near Grand Central, that area, we said if you're going to build there, a commercial building, it has to have transit money going into the transit system, or you can build an open park, or you can save our landmarks. Otherwise, don't build a building. Don't improve your building. And that's a sort of revolutionary way of looking at zoning. So we need transit, we need open space, and we need to save our landmarks. At the same time, we really, really need... Um, affordable housing. So those are some of the, we also have great vision for the community boards. The community boards, how many people have been to a community board or are on a community board? So not, not a lot of you. And so that's like the, we would really love you to participate. Um, again, thanks to the Deputy Borough President and others, we have about 800 people applied this year to our community boards in Manhattan and we interviewed each and every one of them in groups and then we select. And that is the first line of defense for deciding the vision, because the people make a vision. We want you to have the vision for your neighborhood. East Harlem has developed a vision. Inwood is working on the vision. If you want, Lower Manhattan is going from 20,000 people to 65 or 70,000 people in a decade. You need a vision to do that, and it starts at the community board level. What, how many schools, how much open space, it's not easy because some of these buildings are as of right, which I don't need to get into in terms of zoning, but that's why you see these very tall buildings and sometimes ugly is because they were built because we didn't have an impact on the zoning. So our, our vision is to have much more input at the local level. And an easy question, where is your office located? <laughs> We have an office at 1 Center Street, which is right next to City Hall in the Municipal Building. And then we're the first borough president to be, have a district office in Manhattan outside of a tall building. So we're at 431 West 125th Street. It's a storefront. It's ADA accessible. And people come in uh, almost seven days a week, but certainly evenings and weekdays, either for opportunities to learn about pamphlets and government benefits or their housing crisis.
But recently, for instance, we had all the hair braiders in Harlem come in because they're getting tickets because they hadn't gotten licenses the correct way. So we're trying to also, again, in terms of the vision, empower people, give them the tools they need so that they are part of the solution, not part of the challenge. And the hair braiders, 150 of them showed up at the first meeting, all women, uh, because they were getting tickets and had not gotten the proper state licensing. And now they have their own association and were on a path to get them the correct licensing because they could see a local office where they felt comfortable, language proficient was given was also part of the opportunity and the state has changed some of their procedures because they saw the constituency that was there for what they needed. A wealth of resources, thank you. Moving on to a history lesson. It's taking a long time to get to this point and I was hoping that you can sort of run through some of the milestones of achieving the open data law. Well, I'm gonna rely on Will Colgrove also to help me, but what I remember because is that we, oh, we got the technology committee, you're gonna laugh at this, because I supported a guy named Bill de Blasio for speaker long ago for the city council, and he lost. And a person named Christine Quinn, for those of you who've been around just a little bit of time, won the speakership. This is before Melissa and Mark Riverito. And so as a consolation prize, I did not get health committee or housing. I got technology committee, which nobody else wanted. And so then that was the early 2000s, which was a century ago in tech world. And we did a lot of things. We worked on .NYC. I saw Tom Lowenth out here earlier from uh, Queens Community Board, and we worked on webcasting, which ended up passing. So city agencies are supposed to webcast uh, if they have a board under certain circumstances. Um, we worked on trying to open up government. I've always believed that government data should be public going way back even before the internet. For those of you who don't know, there used to be a time when there wasn't the internet. You may not know that. Um, but the issue was, the really, the challenge was agencies wanting to get this data. And what was interesting, just as um, John Keeney said, if you were in his workshop, Sometimes government is more interested in the data even than the outside. So Will will talk more about some of the hurdles and challenges, but what was most interesting to me was that when the data discussion was taking place and after it passed, people most interested in were the other agencies because they couldn't get data from their sister agencies. Don't forget, we're 303,000 employees. The budget is now 82 billion. We're bigger than everything about the federal government, the state of California, the state of New York, and then New York City. The hell with New Jersey and Pennsylvania and Florida. They're all smaller. And we're bigger than half the countries in the world. So to have, when you are one agency calling another, DOE's budget, Department of Education, is 20 billion. So when you're calling another agency, you're really calling another country. And so we're trying to make that easier. But Will can talk a little bit more about how we got here with open data and how Local 11 is implemented and how it came about. Uh, sure, so uh, basically this, actually the history of the open data law is sort of the history of my time in city government too. So I started working for Gail in 2011 um, and the bill, the open data law had actually initially been introduced in 2009, the first iteration of it. So for those of you who aren't familiar with sort of the way the city legislative process works, there are four year sessions, right? Council members are elected to a four year term so bills age out at the end of each four-year term and need to be reintroduced um, in the preceding term. So Gail introduced the bill in 2009, tried to, I think we actually initially had a hearing on it in 2009, bill didn't go anywhere, reintroduced it in 2010, and when I started working in early 2011, um, sort of that was one of the things she sat down and told me as legislative director, you have to get this bill passed. Um, so we knew we had about three years to do it. Um, so really we just started building support um, and the way we did that was really actually working out, reaching out to a lot of people in this room. Um, Beta NYC, reInvent Albany, the New York City Transparency Working Group was really this coalition of advocates that to my knowledge hadn't really ever worked together before, but it was about getting people from around the city, people who worked in technology, worked in good government, 
or were issue area experts who knew that open data would be beneficial to them and to their constituency. So it really started with building that coalition of supporters um, who are going to help us push this forward. Um, then, as, as Gail said, you know, the big issue was just getting support from other agencies. Agencies didn't know what other agencies had. It's not even that I couldn't get data from a sister agency. I didn't even know what data that sister agency had. So just the legwork working with Doit to really understand what the universe of New York City data was was a tremendous hurdle. And I think that's what took, made this process take so long, was even just understanding how complex this process was and trying to think through what it was going to take to really pass the open data law. So again, uh, Gail is a fantastic advocate and does not take no for an answer. So we just basically kept pushing, kept pushing. We had dozens, hundreds of meetings, hundreds of conference calls, tried to get support from every single city council member, leaned on the advocacy community here in New York to really push this forward. Um, and we also had really great support from some city agencies. Uh, Do It deserves a ton of credit. Um, former Commissioner Carol Post at the time was a really early supporter of this. Mayor Bloomberg has always been an advocate for, was always an advocate for big data and really understood the value of this, of this information. So we had a lot of supporters and it was really just pushing, 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 had a couple of hearings. Finally, once people could really wrap their heads around this concept of open data, everyone got it, it made sense, and two years later we passed the bill. There was one uh, point that I made earlier to emphasize if you're trying to pass legislation. I was thinking our constituents are, is the public, right? That was my understanding, wrong. This is a woman, Beth, who is now at NYU. She's at NYU, she had been Clinton's CIO. And I remember we would meet her in coffee shops because she had this son who was very active. He was a pain in the neck, to be honest with you. And we would have to meet with him. We didn't have childcare like uh, is here today. And we would meet her in coffee shops all across the city. Like if she was finishing up a meeting, I would find her in the evening or in the morning with her wonderful son who's now all grown up. And she told me, and I'll never forget it, your, your constituency is not the public. Your constituency is the other agency. Every other agency, if they block this, it's not going to happen. And, and so I keep that in mind. It's a, when you're trying to pass legislation like something that's new and different, you have to think about it differently. And if I hadn't had that information, I'm not sure we would have passed the law. Because we actually went to every single agency and said, this is what we're doing. As opposed to assuming that because it was coming from the top and do it, that there was interest because she had had an executive order under President Clinton, the first one, and she had managed only to get that executive order implemented because she had gone to every single agency. And now that we're this far, where do we still have to go? What work is to be done? Well, I would love to have Will introduce we, uh, some of the students who've been working on the data. John Keeney, if you were in his workshop earlier, talked about some of the, some of the problems. Um, for me, I think the notion is, I mean, 2018 is coming up quite soon. When we passed the law 2018, I was so irritated because it seemed like it was a century far away and that we were never going to get there. But it is a couple of years away now. And a lot of these agencies are not as uh, forthcoming as we would like with the data. We have had good luck with the police department. I have to say in previous years, we didn't. Um, but here's another example. So the police department, and we, Will will talk more about this, has seven major crimes, and that information is desired, but it is up. It took two years to get it up. Just to give you an example, one part of the police department was working on it, the other one was, <laughs> no. And so you have to get within an agency, you have to get them to work together. They finally are, but... We want the other part, which is the summons data, the local data, who's jumping the turnstile, from what communities, because then we can work in those communities and say these are problems that we have to address because you need the granular data. And the issue is people want to know what's going on in their neighborhood. They're blocked. They couldn't care less. I know people who live below 14th Street and they've never been to 96th Street, literally, and they don't care about 96th Street. I don't care about Brooklyn, so I understand that. I'm being facetious, but you know what I mean. People want to know what's going on in their area. And that's the kind of challenge to get that data to be something on the police department, for instance, to be granular. But Bill, Will could add to that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, 
where, where we're going is I think where we are right now in this room. I think this is exactly what, we're, what we want. Step one of the, phase one of the open data process is literally just publishing data. And phase two is actually using that data and making decisions based on it and really making our community a better place with real granular information. Um, so one example of what we're trying to do around actually using open data, um, as Gail mentioned in her speech earlier, is working with the CUNY Service Score, which is a fantastic internship program um, with all the colleges of CUNY, the City University System in New York. Um, we have a group of nine interns working with our office, our CUNY Service Corps, working on a program we call the Civic Innovation Fellows Program. We have some of our fellows here today in the front row, so stand up. I get to publicly embarrass you, everyone. So these students are a fantastic example of really what we think the next phase of the open data process is. These students came to our office. They come from a variety of different colleges. Most of them have studied computer science or statistics. But I think most of them, it's fair to say, didn't know what the open data portal was when they started with our office um, earlier this year. So over the past semester, Noel and I, working with some fantastic partners with support from the Fund for the City of New York, have been training these students how to actually take what's in the open data portal and analyze those local community issues. Phase two of the program, again, we just started is for them to go into the community boards, our most local form of government, and actually help boards use data for their own internal decision making. So when a land use application comes to the board, rather than relying on anecdotes, why not rely on data, actually analyze the state of the neighborhood, what the infrastructure needs are, make better decisions that are gonna lead to better outcomes for New Yorkers. So I think that's where we need to go, and we hope that this is just the beginning of this program. We're piloting in Manhattan, we wanna go citywide. Um, but I think it's really just taking information and actually using it for decision making is where we want to go. One example is, of course, we want the community boards to look like the neighborhoods. You know, and sometimes in the past, the demographics of the neighborhood were something, and then the uh, neighborhood uh, looked like X and the community board looked like Y. Often older than the neighborhood the community board was, and sometimes whiter. So as an example, we can now, again, thanks to Aldrin, um, in 2016, which is where we are now in terms of the appointment round, 785 New Yorkers applied for membership. And we know it's a 9% increase over 2015. We know that 527 are new applicants. That's a 12% increase over 2015. But more importantly, if you look on our website, we know what age applied, what demographic applied, and what's the comparison to what the neighborhood is. And I think that's what people want to know. They want to know that if they go to a uh, local entity that is supposed to represent them, that it really does. Um, and I mentioned earlier that we have 16 and 17 year olds. We would like that kind of info to be available on the open data portal so people can see what exactly is going on in my neighborhood. And following this session, the Civic Innovation Fellows will have their own session, so that we hope that you join them to learn more about their achievements um, as throughout the program. Um, could you tell us a little more about the youth track that is participating in the program today? Um, we have a group of students who are in our, I don't know if they're in this room right now, but they're working. Are the high school students here? They were earlier. There they are. There they are. Look at them. There they are. Thank you. Stand up. Stand up. Welcome. We're so thankful that you can join us. So what we're uh, trying to work on, uh, thanks to Aisha from the office, is this data science initiative that I talked about earlier, and I don't want to repeat what you heard earlier, but it's taking the data that has been accumulated that we've all been uh, excited about, and hopefully people, even more people in this room will be using it, and to look at how that data currently exists, look at what the CUNY innovation uh, scientists are doing, essentially, and how we can use the same tools at the Department of Education. How we can use it to predict uh, what neighborhood demographics are changing and what they will be. Um, I think what's most exciting is what Los Angeles is doing, where people are enjoying the statistics classes because they're taught in a different way. I find that when I speak to high school students, and I do it a lot, graduations, forums, I mean, I have hundreds of high schools in Manhattan, I go often. And what I find is people are most interested in what's going on locally, but they don't have the tools to be able to analyze it and to be able to help predict and be able to be involved in those numbers. And that's what data science is all about. So that's what we would like to initiate. Now, the tools of challenges the toolbox of challenges is even longer. We've got, you know, 
The speed with which data comes into the building at the Department of Education, I am not going to get into right now. It's a challenge. The fact that there isn't such a thing as an actual license of a computer science teacher in the state of New York, that's a challenge. Don't get me started. <laughs> there is a challenge of just training, not just students, but teachers. You know, So there are a lot of issues that have to be overcome, even just to use the data, not to mention the data science. So the reason we're having this uh, task force is to try to overcome some of those challenges, working with computer science for all, which is what uh, the Department of Education, Fred Wilson, Sarah Holloway, who's both of whom are often in this space, are often are also overcoming with some of the work that they're doing. So Department of Education is pushing hard, I think, to try to make students ready for the pipelines. I talked earlier about the half million jobs available in this data science world and not even 200,000 people nationally able to uh, be qualified. We were at uh, Facebook a couple of days ago with all the Intel semifinalists, which is one of the most frightening experiences of my lifetime, to be with 150 Intel finalists. Horrible. I mean, I felt like I was like, I wasn't even close. But um, Facebook is desperate for engineers. They have tons and tons of jobs. So does everybody else, as you know. So. I think what we're saying is we're providing jobs for the future, trying to do it in a way that ties you to your neighborhood. And I think we have time for about one more question before our awesome photograph. Um, and I guess just some concluding remarks. What, uh, maybe a call to action. You know, we emphasize a lot on code, right? A lot on being an engineer, being a developer. But then there's a lot of us, including me, who can't code. Um, how can we participate in this? I think that Elise Beta NYC is trying to make room for all different types of skill levels, all different types of backgrounds. And um, what um, advice can you give us? Well, I'll give some and Will will give some. But I do think the issue is not so much coding, it's, you, it's knowing how to use the data. Somebody else can bring the data to your attention. But how do you use the data to, you, to get people engaged to be able to predict how crime trends will change across the city? What kind of, where will gentrification be moving, although some of us may know that anecdotally, but how will it be moving so that we can, in my opinion, work with the mom and pop stores so they don't get eliminated as soon as the gentrification comes to the neighborhood. Or how many, we're all, I hate to tell you the bad news, but there's soon gonna be more seniors than people under 18 in this city of New York. It's a horrible thought, in my opinion. But there are gonna be more seniors. So what kinds of plans are needed for them with the data? And that involves not just data, but engagement. You have to, like I talked about the community boards, I talked about young people being engaged. It, it takes the work that's going on today at Civic Hall and the work that you're doing in terms of the schooling on how to use the data, to me is more important than the, than the coding. So to be really honest with you, just what you're doing today is what has to be done on even more often on an ongoing basis. Yeah, I mean, a, a couple things. First, on the education side, we actually just had a meeting with a number of people from the DOE who are working on CS for All, um, things like that. And someone made a really good point that, you know, we don't, we don't teach everyone English and math expecting everyone's going to be an author or a mathematician. We don't have to teach computer science to everyone expecting everyone's going to be a computer engineer or a full-time data scientist. It's really just about learning basic concepts and learning how to think through things. It's really, it's logical reasoning, right? So I think you know, what, what we've learned through this CUNY program, what we hope to learn through this high school data science initiative is that anybody can do data science, right? You don't have to be a professional, you don't have to be someone with 20 years of experience in a PhD to do this type of analysis. Um, it's really just taking a little bit of time, going to more beta NYC events, you know, going to, if you're interested in the community boards, we do open data trainings. I'm not a technologist, I don't have, I have a political science degree, not exactly a hard science. Um, and, you know, I think, really just based on my experience working for Gale and trying to pass the open data law, I've picked up a lot of skills that I never really thought I would. Um, so I think everyone can do it. That's the first step we need to get over. There's this sort of fear, I think, a lot of times around data science that you have to be 
a really quanty person to get into this stuff, but I don't think that's true. I think it's a misnomer. So I think everyone can do it and everyone should do it because again, if you really want to start using data for decision making, it shouldn't be just one type of person and one type of mind that's analyzing this information. It really needs to come from everybody. So if we want, you know, we want our community boards to look the way our city looks. We need everybody to be using this information. Um, there, there shouldn't be any barriers to entry here. Um, you know, and then going forward again, it's really just having everyone work, work more collaboratively together. We see this in government all the time that, you know, hand A doesn't talk to hand B. I think you see that all across the country. There's a lot of duplication of effort around a lot of these issues. And I think there just needs to be more collaborative spaces for people to come together and talk about these big issues. I think Civic Hall is a great example of that. Obviously, we have people coming together and making sure that we're actually sharing best practices and sharing ideas. And I think one of the best things about technology is we can use things like GitHub, we can use listservs to really share information and not keep repeating the same thing over and over again. And the best example is garbage. I am fascinated by garbage. Um, it costs you, as the taxpayer, a fortune to get rid of it. And no, we talk about recycling, we talk about patrecibles, we talk about organics, we talk about um, the Department of Sanitation can pick up your clothes uh, so you don't put that in the landfill. All these efforts are taking place. And to the credit of sanitation, they're now meeting with the Department of Education, they're meeting with other agencies to try to figure this out. But to, you know, to be really specific, something like that needs the data. And it needs your input. Well, you cannot get rid of the garbage without civic engagement. It's plastic bags, you know, you know the list. Um, but it takes engagement and data. And education, all three. And that's what you're doing here today, so congratulations. That's exactly what you're doing here today. So we clearly learned that we all have a role in open data in this process. Um, please give another hand to Gail and Will. Thank you so much. And don't go anywhere. It is time for our epic photo. So I think the way that we're going to do it is we're all going to sort of line up in our seats, maybe stand up. We're going to bring this awesome banner and we're going to have the photographer stand on the stage and take a picture of all of us. Um, so just bear with us for a few moments. Oh yeah, um, it seems like we have a few minutes for questions. Maybe we can accept two questions. Um, any questions for Gail and Will? Yes, come forward. So I appreciate that you mentioned taking out the trash. Um, has there been any data collected around uh, private sanitation collection and the crazy wackadoodle mess that that is with all these private companies handling that? I certainly know the issue. Is that working? Okay. I certainly know the issue of the private carters and the fact that they go down different, uh, sometimes the same street picking up at different times. And I don't want to get into the specifics. I don't know what the data is, but it's a perfect example of why data and engagement is needed in that case from the uh, individual commercial enterprises. And then there's the issue of how do you deal with trucks coming into the city? Delivery, should they be during the night, during the day? Which kind of trucks, which doors are open? So the whole issue of how you deliver to the commercial enterprises and how you deal with their pickup of their garbage is an ongoing discussion. And I don't know how much data there is. I do know it's a big problem. Hi again. Uh, so my question is actually about sanitation and in community engagement because, for instance, where I live, even today on a Saturday, there is uh, pile drivings and other very, um, let's say, disruptive um, construction going on. And my building, I've lived there for more than nine years, and we're just told, oh, call 311, but nothing happens. And similarly, I actually work for the Department of Sanitation, but I see the private commercial truckers uh, basically breaking the law. 
they basically pull over, like on my street, which is West End, collect from that side of the street, and then someone in the car gets out and stops traffic, if there is any, so they can diagonally go across the street. And I've actually recorded this twice, uh, and pick up trash on the other side. And they're obnoxiously loud and much louder than the Department of Sanitation, and they also come in the middle of the night. So what can we do other than taking documentation of it and going to 311? I'm always dealing with constituents. Um, you would definitely, I think the answer to that is you call, 311 is as good as the uh, operator. You have to call your local elected officials. That is more complicated than a 311 person can answer. That's great for data at 311, but it doesn't solve the problem. In community boards, we call ourselves 311 follow up. And that's exactly what it is. So I think that's the answer to that question. I think we had another question in the front. All right. <clears throat> uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jalen Downer. So, you know, I'm a high school student, right? So I'm Oh, I go to Food and Finance High School on West 50th Street between 10th and 11th Avenue. It's like, so I heard you be working with other agencies, right? So I'm curious, is there any problems with, is there any problems you're working with the DOE to solve or stuff like that? I'm just curious. Does this work? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a number of issues we're working with, with DOE to solve. I'll, I'll answer a few and then let Gail add to it. But one of the biggest issues is actually how the DOE is using technology. So I mentioned briefly that we've had a series of sort of roundtable conversations with the DOE around the use of technology in the classroom. And that's everything from infrastructure development to actual curricula around how we're actually educating people on technology um, and bringing technology into every, into every other subject area, not just computer science, but how we're using it for math, how we're using it for social studies, et cetera. Um, so, you know, there are a lot, of, obviously the DOE is a massive system. There are a lot of roadblocks and a lot of bureaucratic challenges there. Um, but one of the big things we're trying to figure out is how can we make sure that we're sort of thinking about technology holistically across the entire education system. And the DOE has been great. They've been meeting with us. Um, a few other things that people should know about um, regarding technology. One is there was a bill passed at the state level called the Smart Schools Bond Act about a year and a half ago. And that was a $2 billion bond purchase that was allowed by the passage of that legislation that's gonna to go towards school technology across the state of New York. New York City's share of that is about $780 million. And the, the NYC DOE has just put forward a plan for how they plan to use that money. Most of it's gonna to go towards increasing bandwidth and capacity within schools. But there's actually gonna be a public hearing on that this month. Um, check the DOE website. Um, I don't have the exact date, but that's a huge opportunity to weigh in and make sure that the proposal is meeting the needs of, that you see. So if you have issues at your school, you know, you should let, think about that, think about what the issues are. I mean, as always, as Gail said, our office is always open. If people have issues, we always wanna hear them and we're constantly talking to the DOE about this stuff. <laughs> 